Hello, welcome everyone. I am David Crowley, president of SCI, one of two organizations that collaborates on this leadership, Leaders for an Equitable Tomorrow program, or LET for short. And my colleague, Leora here from Network for Social Justice was actually going to be um, attending and attending the conversation, but we had a last minute, Marissa uh, Luce was not able to join us due to a family emergency. So Leora kindly uh, stepped onto our panel. So uh, today, this is the second in a series we're doing to talk about careers uh, for young people, a conversation among youth to be able to learn about what careers look like in the field of nonprofits and community organizing and activism works. We had a great conversation on that topic last month and we're, we have a great panel uh, to talk on that same subject today. And I know um, when each panel has sent these quite lengthy and impressive biographies and uh, I thought it would be great to actually just kind of tee up the first question and have each panelist Kind of respond and give a sense of your current work uh, to get us going. So uh, as opposed to me uh, just reading, uh, reading those bios. So what we're going to do is, as I said to some of you earlier, I do have some prepared questions, but we want to keep this pretty informal as well. So um, if folks that have joined to tune in have questions as we go, please drop them in the chat. And also, if you feel like you want to say something or share something or or don't want to sort of filter your question through me you can let let me know that you'd like to like to ask your question or comment directly as well but to kick it off nobody responded to my you know do you do you like to go first or last or anything like that so i'm gonna kick it kick it off and and ask samuel if you if you can kick us off by talking about what you what your current work looks like uh to kind of give us a little self-intro and then some of my subsequent questions are going to try to draw out, you know, how you got to where you are today. So you don't have to give the whole story now. Maybe kind of just bring us to the current current moment and the work you do, uh, kind of what the work looks like for you. Yeah. Well, again, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Sam Gebru. Um, I moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts. Well, I moved to the United States when I was three uh, and have lived in Cambridge since. Um, and uh, currently, uh, I'm a consultant. I have my own firm called Black Lion Strategies, um, and I'm also uh, what's known as a senior fellow um, at Tufts University within the Center for State Policy Analysis. Uh, as a consultant, I work with politicians, with nonprofits, uh, with uh, anyone really uh, seeking to what I call get into good trouble, right? Uh, as the hoodie says, as, as the way John Lewis uh, urged us to do. Um, and uh, help with whether it's fundraising or communications or uh, policy and advocacy, government relations, community engagement. Um, and then on the tough side, um, I work at a center that specializes in researching on different policy issues at the state level um, and making recommendations to lawmakers, helping them think through uh, the impacts of the ideas and the decisions that they're making. Great. So not one, but two jobs at the current moment. So that's great. So definitely will be some good things to follow up there. Ariana, would you like to jump in next? Yes, thank you. So my name is Ariana. I'm the communications manager at Budget Buddies. And Budget Buddies is a nonprofit that does financial wellness programs as well as one-on-one -on -one coaching for women living on low incomes. And as the communications manager, I do a lot of external communications, which just means like, trying to recruit participants, people, women who want to join our program, who need our program, who are interested, finding volunteers. I do a lot through social media, as well as like websites for volunteers, um, creating materials to teach people about our organization, to get um, the volunteers trained, and then also like internal communications and um, right now, I'm working on a big project to rebrand Budget Buddies. We're going to get a new name, new logo, new everything. So stay tuned for that. It will be pretty exciting. Um, but it's really cool because that's like super creative. Right now, I'm working like with a team of um, designers for the logo. So if you guys are into like, I don't know if you're into graphic design, but it's actually really fun and the fonts and all the colors and I get to play with all these color palettes. So it's kind of a little artistic right now if you guys like that type of thing. Great, thank you. And I think one, one thing you've brought up already that I think will be a good theme to circle around is 
just the way I think sometimes we think of nonprofits that serve direct service kind of roles, which is important and essential, but there are a lot of skill sets and, and types of jobs within the sector. So I think we're already starting to see that. So let's pass, pass the mic to Brian uh, to talk, talk next about what, what your current work looks like. Hey y'all, so my name is Brian. I'm the Strategic Program Specialist at the Becker Foundation, which is a small family foundation um, up here in Boston. Um, a family foundation or foundations in general are, are grant-making institutions, so they provide funding for um, nonprofits to do the work that they do. And so in my role, I help uh, the board with their strategic planning and choosing what um, outcomes they wish to see in the world. Um, and then working with nonprofits to um, align them with our funding programs and make sure that they have technical assistance when necessary and things like budget planning or organizational development. Great, great. Thank you, Brian. And now, Leora. Hi, everybody. I'm Leora. Um, we just went through rebranding the Network for Social Justice, so we did a lot of playing with colors. Um, so I really relate to that. It was actually really creative and somewhat stressful on the back end. Um, so I run the Network for Social Justice, which is a relatively small nonprofit in Winchester. We call ourselves Small But Mighty. I actually only have four staff members, but we are really volunteer driven and run. Can just see a cat's tail, no, nothing else. And um, we work towards community advocacy and organizing in the suburbs. So we changed our name a few years ago. We were the Network for Social Justice. Sorry, we are the Network for Social Justice. That makes more sense. And we were the Winchester Multicultural Network. And I think when we changed and we took Winchester out of our name, it wasn't accidental. We did it because, well, we were in a rebranding. Um, but we were also thinking a little more about reaching beyond Winchester as a suburb and thinking about social justice across suburban communities because I feel we felt like there was a little too much reinventing the wheel. And there was that was stopping us from doing some of the collaborations like this one, which would be beneficial a little broader and a little deeper than we were going in the work. Um, alongside the network, I still teach. I used to be a professor of Middle Eastern studies, and now I teach master's courses actually on grant writing and strategic development um, at uh, Regis College. So sort of two hats starting Wednesday again. Great. Thank you, Liliara. Now that we'd like to start getting into a little how you got to where you are. So um, and maybe we can reverse order, uh, just just keep that. So put put it back to you, Lear. But the way I wanted to frame this is this program is targeted for high school students starting to think about career paths. And so think back, if you could, panelists, to when you were in high school. Were you did you imagine envision you doing something like you're doing now? And if so, maybe how that came to be. But if not, you know, where, where along your journey and your career did you start seeing? Um, seeing your way to doing nonprofit and community work and what 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 motivated that? So reverse order, you start. Yeah, so if you want to start us, Leora, if you're up for that. So when I was in high school, I was very clear that I wanted to go into journalism. Um, and um, I loved writing. I still love writing. And um, and I felt like that was sort of my skill set. And I liked adventure and I liked traveling and I liked talking to people. Um, and I, I did. I went to school. I became a journalist and um, I was immediately deployed to the Middle East. And one of the things deployed, I found a job in the Middle East. I wasn't in the army. Um, sorry. And one of the things that I sort of noticed very quickly is what I was covering and what I was writing about, I was more interested in understanding in a little more detail. Um, I felt like I was only getting part of the story. And that sort of led me almost directly to community work because I was covering at the time the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I was meeting a lot of Israelis in very different um, parts of the country and areas of work and they all didn't think the same. And I was meeting a lot of Palestinians and they also were doing very different things, not thinking the same, struggling in different ways. And so I became really interested in how people organized as community. 
And it wasn't necessarily a hop, skip and a jump to working in a tiny suburban community, but that was really how I started. Um, went to school initially and got a master's and a PhD and all that fun stuff, but then went back and really wanted to think about how to help community the best. And I thought that might be by running a very small organization. Um, I, I never wanted to work in a really large organization and um, was very fortunate to, with I had an MBA in nonprofit management, find this job at the network and they've been there ever since. So this is my, I just finished my third year. And probably feels like a lot more than three, right? Because <laughs> I only old. started about 10 months before the pandemic. So I barely got my feet wet in Wincha. I'm from summer. I'm in Somerville myself. I'm Canadian originally, but um, I barely got my feet wet. And then, um, well, you all know what happened. So it felt a little strange as we climbed back out of that. Great. So Brian, when you were in high school, did you envision yourself working at the Becker Foundation someday? Um, no, in fact, I, you know, I, we're so small that I don't even know if I've still heard of us. Um, I don't know if I knew what a foundation was in high school. I, um, I think my, my career memory is that I would watch uh, things like PBS and documentaries and see these experts who would answer, like, I know I'm an expert in this subject. And I was fascinated at how one would become one. Um, and I went to school uh, to study history. Um, and I, my first day was like, I don't want to be a history teacher. Um, I don't know what I want to do with history. And so I just uh, lived life um, as one does. And when I graduated from college, I decided to do AmeriCorps um, with SCI. I it was a recommendation from a professor that I had to go to do some time in Woburn. And I am a generalist in the nonprofit world. I started um, in program, I started teaching theater and then someone moved me over to communications. And then I moved over to finance and someone moved me to development. And I just like this world of um, living in all different parts of the, the brain and the, the workspace. Um, but I reached a point in my career where I felt like there were, there were no other avenues for me to go if I didn't move over to a different um, side of the brain. So I looked at, instead of working directly in uh, nonprofit work, to move over to the funding side of the house. And to do that, I went and got my MBA in nonprofit management and a master's in public policy. I think we are, we both are Heller alum, I'm guessing. Um, Among other places. <laughs> we, yeah, you have a thousand degrees, so I guess, of, of the one that I share with you. Um, and it, it, was a, it was a desire that came from um, working with funders in the, the world and seeing how their brain works and how my brain could work, but also seeing challenges that they saw particularly um, in, in, in injustice and injustice of, of what, what they deal with that I felt like I could make some change. Great, thank you. And as, as we move along, I would encourage pan, uh, folks watching, tuning in to start sharing some questions. I do have questions re at the ready to continue the conversation. We'd love to get some audience participation. So please into the chat with any questions. Ariana, are you gonna be the one that tells us you dreamed of being a nonprofit professional when you were in high school? Um, I don't know. I think so when I was in high school, I didn't really have like a dream job. So. I knew what I wanted to study. I have a um, degree in international affairs, which um, so much fun. I loved my degree, but I knew I never wanted to work in politics, especially international politics. Um, I really loved the, like Brian said, they studied history. I love the history. I love the, like studying it, but I didn't want to practice it. So I think I kind of fell into nonprofits because I really enjoy being around people who have the same, we're not all the same, but we're all on the same mission and we all have the same vision and ideals. And I really like being surrounded by people who are here to empower other people and help other people. And I don't, I don't know if I could ever go back to a private sector where they're just expecting you to produce something. They're expecting you to um, create profit for them. So <laughs> I really like that I can just kind of be with people with a similar mind and try to help whoever we can. Great. Thanks. Sam, sa same question to you. you know, yeah. What did you see yourself doing in high school and how did you evolve to where you are now? Yeah. So, so uh, I, I actually uh, got my start in um, politics and uh, community engagement as an eighth grade student. So a little different. Um, so growing up, you know, uh, obviously, like every other kid had a million different dream jobs. Um, 
uh, and uh, sort of, you know, my middle school dream was to become a pilot. I really wanted to become a pilot, um, still kind of do, um, but, but it's sort of gone to the back burner uh, among uh, many other things on my bucket list. But uh, in eighth grade, I sort of discovered that I had this passion for community organizing and, and politics and social justice. And uh, that led to some interesting uh, work that I did um, uh, you know, uh, raising money uh, for women with childbirth injuries um, uh, to working on a local city council campaign um, that propelled me into an internship into the state Senate, um, where uh, two days after school in high school, I would go to the state Senate, um, uh, take the train from Harvard Square to uh, Park Street and, and uh, walk up the steps to be able to um, work for my state senator. Um, and it just gave me a really great opportunity to see how government worked on the inside. Uh, having worked on a political campaign, I saw how politics worked out worked on the outside, uh, but governing is a whole different thing from running for office. And so I was able to see both sides of that. Um, you know, that led to other campaign jobs. Uh, I studied political science in college, um, and you know, no surprise there, I guess. Um, and um, you know, really since have just continued to be in that space. Space. Um, and so uh, a lot of the jobs that I've had uh, have all been either uh, working for nonprofits uh, or working, working on political campaigns, uh, either running them as the campaign manager or, or, or uh, serving as a senior member of the staff, whether it's, uh, you know, having led communications efforts or uh, volunteers and organizing um, or uh, serving as the deputy campaign manager and handling fundraising and other tasks. And so uh, have sort of, you know, worked uh, across the gamut. Um, and then also, um, uh, you know, having served on different nonprofit boards, um, uh, you know, giving your, uh, giving myself sort of a different perspective for how nonprofits are run. Um, and uh, uh, for those of you who may not know what a board is, a nonprofit board of directors, uh, it's uh, a group of people that oversee the nonprofit and they make sort of the, the bigger level decisions. Um, uh, they don't get involved in the sort of day-to-day -day management of things. Uh, they lead that to the executive director or the president or the CEO or whatever that person's title may be. Uh, but their job is to hire or fire that person. They evaluate the person uh, and they also determine what the budget looks like. Like the rest of it, they sort of leave to the staff to do. And so, you know, getting that perspective uh, was also very interesting um, to me. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I, I sort of got my calling uh, at a young age and uh, knew what I wanted to do. And uh, uh, I benefited heavily from having mentors that opened doors for me um, uh, that sort of saw this potential in this young kid um, and, and allowed me to, to learn and thrive and you know, flourish and uh, what I was doing. Um, and so now, you know, uh, I, I try to do the same uh, whenever I see a young person. I'm very quick to give out my cell phone number, my email, whatever it is. And, and, and you know, I do say, like, I expect you to reach out to me. Um, and if you don't, I'll be very disappointed, you know, and, uh, and helping young people uh, find their passion. Uh, you know, you're never too young uh, to, to do what you want to do. And so uh, I learned that very early on. That's great. Thanks. Sam, I don't know if you have any follow-up advice. I think somewhere along the, we, we intended to get into mentoring for the young people joining today. Any suggestions on like how to find a mentor or, or reach out uh, 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 from your experience? Yeah, don't, don't be shy. Like, honestly, so, so, you know, one thing I learned very early on was, um, you know, a lot of like people with whatever important jobs or whatever you want to use the term, um, you know, they, they also like talking about themselves. They like sharing about themselves and what they do. Um, and, uh, you know, never hesitate to reach out because you'll be, you'll be really surprised, but, you know, people are happy to, you know, grab coffee or, you know, take a walk and talk about, uh, what it is that they do or, or, uh, you know, nowadays, I guess it's much easier. You can just sort of hop on a video call, but people are very willing to, to reach out and, and, or, uh, you know, be sought after and, um, share what they do. So, um, I, and I think like part of it also was just as a young person, I think there's a little, uh, novelty. It's like, oh, like, cool. A young person's reaching out to me, like, sure, I'll make time for you. Um, and so, uh, use your age to your advantage, you know, um, when you're reaching out to folks, you know, say whatever, I'm a 50, year old high school student or something uh because that sounds impressive you know you don't you don't always get a 15 year old high school student reaching out to you uh, asking about 
career advice or, or college advice or internship advice or whatever. Um, and so uh, definitely leverage that. Um, you know, it's very easy to reach out to people nowadays, whether, uh, you know, you want to tweet at them or, or, you know, find them on LinkedIn or, um, you know, a lot of people have um, uh, websites where their email address is listed or there's some sort of contact form. So, uh, and, you know, sometimes I just picked up the phone and called uh, the, the phone number that, that was listed. And so uh, you, you never know, you know, how someone's going to respond to you. Um, but the worst thing that they can say is say no if you reach out. But, but if there's somebody doing something interesting and you're like, hey, I kind of want to learn more about that, even if I don't know anything about what they do, just reach out. Like it really, and, 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 and don't, don't hesitate to um, put yourself out there. Like, you know, if, if you want to reach out to somebody, uh, you know, don't, don't wait for the right moment or whatever, because there, there never will be. So just, just do it. Great advice. Thanks, Sam. Brian, there's a question posed in the chat actually from Leora, just to, if you could elaborate on that term being a nonprofit generalist, what, tell us more what, that, what that's about and why, why it appeals to you too, maybe. Uh, sure. So I, I think of it in, in two different ways. One is that I spent um, a good amount of time uh, working in a nonprofit theater and a, a pretty decent amount of time working in, in the environment um, or the environmental area. And I'm, um, I'm not really committed to any one mission. I find a bunch of missions to be really exciting in the nonprofit world. Um, and I could see myself working in a variety of organizations. Um, so I think about generalism in that way if I don't specialize in a mission. On the other side of things, in terms of what I would actually do in a nonprofit, having been excited by organizational development and development in general or fundraising, um, finance or communications, I'm not really committed to what I do in a nonprofit. Um, I think there's a, there's a pathway for, for generalists that, that typically ends up with um, a deputy director or an ED or a, an executive director or a chief of staff or whatever you wanna call it um, in terms of administration. But, I, I like the pathway that says you don't focus on one particular avenue of in, um, intrigue. Great, thanks. Would love to hear the panel and, and maybe we can turn, turn, to, turn to Ariano or, and or Leora if you wanna take, take the next question to just from, from your experience and your path, obviously students here probably might not follow the exact same path, but just advice things if people think, hmm, working in nonprofits is something I might want to do. What, somebody sitting in high school, any suggestions as to either, you know, course of study they might want to think about or and or experiences they should try to avail themselves of uh, to, to get into or explore the nonprofit sector? Either you want to jump in? Yeah, I can yeah. go for yeah. it first. So I think you can definitely get involved with nonprofits at any age. You can volunteer. Um, I used to work at a nonprofit where the high school students would get stipends to tutor middle school students or um, would go into schools and teach their peers about whatever the topic is, don't vape or um, menstrual topics and stuff like that. So you can definitely get involved in a way that you can get experience for like college applications or future jobs, um, but also meeting people and having a connection to the organization and having a connection to other organizations that you can work with. Um, I think in school you can study. I studied international affairs and I'm a communications manager. So um, I feel like anything in your university time that you are passionate about that you love you will get experience in writing and um, analyzing and researching and doing everything. That's what college is for, to teach you these critical thinking skills and how to process information. So whatever, like Brian, they went for history. So it's similar, like just a topic we love. And then it taught us these key skills. So as long as you're happy, I think with your choice in what you study, I think you'll get everything out of it you need for whatever career you're interested in. We are, that's on, that's on. Yeah, I think there's been some really good advice given here. Um, I think it was um, Samuel who said, use your youth to your advantage. I um, My inbox is full every morning when I wake up and I will prioritize any email I get from a student, like a hundred percent. We do have a youth internship program at the network. You know, we take high school students. Increasingly, we're thinking of taking some middle school students. Um, and that's a great way to get involved. Just like Ariana said, like just being able to to volunteer.
here and do that. But what I might challenge students to do is do something a little outside of your comfort zone, because now's the time to be able to do it. It's It really is about transferable skills, and you'll learn sort of how those work, and you'll see those reappearing across your life. You probably already know what you love. You might also know what you're good at. Um, and then there's also the area where you got to push past that and figure out what, um, what else is going to surprise you that you're good at or that you love. So reach out to organizations that you're interested in, which might be way outside of your wheelhouse or your comfort zone. Um, that would be my advice. That's, you know, when I was trying to think, my sister was doing a lot of work um, in prostitute drop-in centers in Toronto um, during the early 90s, late 80s, actually, when um, the HIV AIDS epidemic was just running rampant in a lot of major cities. We lived in Toronto and I started coming with her some, some afternoons. I think my parents didn't necessarily know I was coming with her. She was quite a bit older than me. Um, and it sort of opened my eyes. I didn't know that at the time, but it opened my eyes to the way different drop-in centers worked, the way community was organized differently. There was definitely a community in Toronto that was doing this work, the way volunteers and the open and closed door for volunteers, how they were raising money, you know, donations that were coming in the door from different um, food sources that, you know, were being given sometimes in the back door, sometimes in the front door. And I sort of started taking that in at a pretty young age. And that was, um, that kind of marinated in terms, and I never would have normally done that. So challenge yourself outside of the box was what I might suggest. Okay, thanks. Well, speaking of challenges, that's actually a um, segue to something else I wanted to bring up. And again, I invite um, the audience to chime in with additional questions. But speaking of challenges, I'd like to hear each of you perhaps reflect on something, an aspect of working in the sector that you find particularly challenging, maybe a little bit of as to how you address that challenge. And, and we've kind of gone back and forth. So whoever feels moved to speak to that, maybe if you want to raise your hand or, or just jump in, uh, and then others can flow in as, as you feel moved. Anyone want to take that what you find challenging in the sector? And you only get one. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll jump in and we'll see if somebody else feels similarly. I am very, even though actually like I, I did do an MBA in nonprofit management and I actually focused on philanthropy, like I focused on raising money. I find it really challenging to fundraise. I think um, the sort of global slash local environment has made it more challenging as people have gotten so exhausted from COVID. Um, it's definitely a little harder in, in my sphere. Okay, this is two challenges to bring in volunteers and get people really engaged in the work. But it's also hard to sell people on new programs and how to give to new programs. And, um, and I think a lot of people hate asking for money. So I would be curious among um, my fellow panelists who else might feel this way or this is not a challenge for them at all and then you should come talk to me. I, I, I agree. Oh. I think directly asking for money was one of the weirdest things for me to be like, I'm like, oh, let me tell you this wonderful story about our programs and how it impacted these people. And then it's like, no, just directly, can we, we need help. We need funding. <laughs> so I agree with you, Laura. Brian, you would seem like you're getting it, wanted to chime in. I'm like, I would love a world in which I only had to ask for money for, for new programs because I feel like funders are so in love with starting something new and it's harder to find funding for uh, programs that, that have a track record, programs that are providing consistent good work and aren't necessarily um, changing changing what they do every year to, to put on a shiny new bow. Um, but I, I think for me, one of my challenges is that I think a deep well that exists inside of me is, is feeling um, that I'm working towards justice. And at the same time that that well uh, gets taken from. So I was working in Lawrence during uh, the gas explosions of uh, 2018 and my neighborhood um, was rising in smoke as I was coming home. And my work pivoted, uh, my organization pivoted to provide a lot of direct service for families like mine who were displaced and then families like mine who had no heat, no hot water, no, um, no ability to cook. And I think that made my work so much better in terms of when you're working towards something where you have a, a, a deep connection. And at the same time, when you are so close to conflict and so close to trauma, it, it, it colors and it changes your vision and it, it takes a lot from you. And I, 
I always struggle in nonprofit work of how close do I want to be to the, the center of the action and how, how far away do I need to be to be safe and, and comfort and or comfortable and, and moving forward. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I just wanted to echo Brian that um, working especially in programs like directly with participants before, especially when I worked with kids, I'm like, I want all of them to be like, I want to help them in every single way. And I want everyone to come with me from start to finish. And I want to watch them grow and do this, but that's not always possible. So you kind of also have to realize like, you're going to do what good you can, but you can't always do it for every single person. And you're not always going to see the end result also. Sam. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Little little different take uh, on on the fundraising side. I actually love raising money. Uh, I, I I I like asking people for money. Uh, I think sometimes the the challenge actually is, um, and you know Brian, I mean maybe you've you've seen this, uh, and uh, having not heard of the Becker Foundation, uh, not sure how you how you all operate, but. Um, you know, uh, sometimes the, the the challenge that I've actually experienced on the fundraising side is, you know, trying to talk to a potential funder that just has different priorities, right? And so, how do you um, how do you align uh, those uh, priorities? How do you um, uh, sort of get the funder to see your way, right? And and to support what you're doing. Uh, uh, sometimes funders like to be very specific with how they give money, and and they try to direct. You know, it has to go to this or it has to go to that. Um, um, which you know sometimes may make sense, uh, but sometimes you're just looking for uh, sort of more of a, what's called a general operating support, and so just general money that you can then decide where you want that to go, um, as opposed to something that's specific. So uh, I always love it when a funder's like, "Here's X amount of dollars, and spend it however you think uh, it makes sense." You know, um, I think you know sort of Leora and Brian um, alluded to this, but you know, uh, the people sort of who are on the front lines doing the work, uh, they're the ones that actually know more about the problem and they they have the solutions, they know what it takes. So, you know, am I gonna tell you how to do your job or, or sort of, or am I just gonna let you have the tools that you need to do your job? But I think, you know, uh, in this era of COVID, um, you know, uh, and I, you know, I have some words about COVID, but it, not friendly for a recorded uh, uh, session, but, uh, you know, I think part of it has just been like trying to stay motivated and sane. Um, you know, uh, I call myself an impatient optimist, um, and I am, uh, but, but, you know, I, I just think, especially like in the early days of COVID, um, where there was just so much uncertainty, it looked like the whole world was on fire, um, you know, we were all locked down, secluded to our homes, I'm an extreme extrovert, I love being around people, I feed off of that energy, um, you know, and, and so not having that and, and having to you know, be secluded and and seeing, you know, just the awful news coverage from other countries, even here in the United States, uh, you know, major cities like New York, just, you know, where it looked like everybody was dying. And that was tough, you know, so sometimes, you know, uh, when you're in the sort of, you know, um, public service or public sector type of work, uh, whether it's nonprofits or politics or, or sort of anything that's like on the front lines, um, uh, you have your days where you're just like, oh my goodness, like, is what I'm doing enough? Is it, is it sufficient? Um, you know, you start sort of questioning and doubting yourself a little bit. Uh, but then, you know, like, fine, I'll, I'll have like that one or two hours of self-doubt and it's like, snap back out of it. You know, uh, you're doing something important. Um, you know, everybody is, and it's, it's all, all the parts together is what, uh, is what will uh, sort of cause, you know, change to happen and, and, and hopefully uh, make our planet a better place to be. And so, you know, um, there, there are those days of sort of despair and hopelessness and, and questioning um, sort of what it is that you're doing and how is it, you know, impacting the world um, and, and losing motivation. And in those moments, um, I think, you know, what's been helpful to me is I, I, have, uh, I have a lot of friends that um, uh, do what I do. They're sort of in a similar space as me, but then I also have friends that, that completely don't do what I do. And, and I like that balance uh, to be able to sort of, you know, turn off uh, some parts of my brain sometimes and, you know, talk to people who are in the sciences or who are in the arts or whatever. And it's just, it's really great to talk to people about other things aside from, you know, politics or, or, or whatever. Um, and, and that's been really helpful. But then even, you know, for people who do similar 
work uh, to me, um, you know, we just are able to self motivate or rather motivate each other. Uh, we're, we're able to, you know, share experiences. And it's always good to know that you're not the only one thinking about something that you're not the only one worrying about something or experiencing something, um, you know, uh, having sort of that, that, you know, um, that, that sort of shared experience is really helpful. Um, and, and finding people that can help you think through, you know, am I crazy? Am I thinking something like, you know, or, or does this make sense? Are other people feeling this way? Um, and that's always helpful to have those types of conversations, uh, especially if you just start doubting yourself or doubting the work that you do. Uh, and I think we've all experienced it. Like, even if you're in school, uh, you're just like, you know, am I good enough? Is this worth it? Like, why am I even here? Um, you know, uh, so it's just important to be able to talk it out with people that you trust. Um, and having a, a sort of circle, a, a small circle of uh, people that you can always go to for anything, um, that's always been helpful to me. Actually, kind of, thanks, Sam. That, that actually is another topic I want to touch upon, so I'd love to hear how other panelists think about how you sustain the work, how you take care of yourself, given that you know, it, is, it is tough work, and, and, and several of you have touched upon this in different ways already. Anyone else want to get in on that? Brian, or you look like maybe one of the mics. Well, my, you know, my answer is, is an organizational one, which is, I think, such a boring answer, but fair compensation and starting with the, the who you are as an employee organizationally is, I think, a great way to start where we exist in a mindset in the nonprofit sector that nonprofit means that folks who work in nonprofits have to bear no profit um, <laughs> to exist. And that's a false narrative that I think um, needs to be challenged consistently. Um, and I think for me, one of the, the ways that I can sustain my work is deciding when I feel like I need to sacrifice and when I feel like I need to, to invest in myself. Um, and, and how that works out changes depending on the mission that I'm in and, and who I'm working with. But I don't think that we need to be martyrs of our work to, to be successful, mm -hmm. which I do think that I encounter folks who, who disagree with me on that. And I think, you know, good luck to them. Leora or Ariana, want to get in on this? So how do you sustain yourself in this world? I mean, I think that's a great point that Brian just made and very eloquently. I um I would, would struggle to make a similar point and I really see it across the sector and regardless of which position you happen to be in. Um, also the... Um, and I think, and I get this from students as well, you're so lucky to be able to do this. I wish my job was like as fulfilling. It's amazing that you're able to be out in community. Um, flexibility of hours, nonprofit people often work, oh, on Sundays or on Saturdays. Um, but then, you know, there may be times during the week where you're not necessarily in front of your computer. And I think all of that does come with this career. And I am lucky to be in it. And we are all lucky to be doing what we're doing if we're enjoying it. But, um, but yes, it's sort of um, builds into this false narrative of compensation and what you need to be paid given you're, given you're doing something you like. Um, and I wish for all of us to be doing something I like. So I think that's one big thing. I think the other thing that came to mind when you mentioned it is um, sort of building a nonprofit community in what you're doing. I think sometimes it very much can feel sort of like you're siloed or that you're doing the work by yourself, um, even sometimes if you have a large staff. Never mind if you vote small staff. Um, and so sort of building up those connections across organizations or through the networks that you went to school with, as well as having, you know, friends and family that are not connected, but having folks in the field who sort of understand what you're dealing with. Yeah, great. Ariana, I don't know if you want to get in on the, what sustains you or how you. How yeah, you I definitely agree work. with um, both of the previous speakers about this because uh, I feel like this is probably the best like work-life balance I've had so far. I mean, I graduated university in 2018, so I'm pretty new to the career field. But um, before this, I was, before I worked in nonprofit, I was a teacher. So I had from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. kids and um, constantly I had a 30-minute lunch break. And I just feel like it's nice to be able to... Um, have that balance. Even working from home, like I have my home office and when I'm working, I'm in my office. When I'm not, I'm in my house. So I really like the remoteness of things. Um, and you can work from anywhere. I, I'm from Arizona. I spent a whole month in the winter working from Arizona to visit my family. So 
that was nice. And I also could escape the snow. So it's kind of cool to be able to have the flexibility and like, I guess that's part of remote working for any work, but I really do enjoy having the time and energy for myself, no commute. So um, another question, David, oh, yeah, um, just in. to yeah. add one more thing, um, you know, because this is, uh, I mean, admittedly, this is like an area of growth for me. This is something that I'm still uh, working on. Um, but, but you know, uh, there's there's this saying that, um, you know, uh, I often hear more and more nowadays, uh, joy is an act of resistance. Um, and um, what, what I think is important about that is, um, you know, especially in, in this type of work that really like takes a lot out of you and, and is, uh, you know, it's meaningful, but it's also it could be draining is, um, you know, make sure that you um, have moments in your life, uh, moments in your day, moments in your week uh, that are to yourself, uh, where, where you're having fun, you're taking some time for yourself, self-care, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and not necessarily as a reward for something, um, you know, it, it, you shouldn't have to reward yourself with uh, time uh, to yourself or time off or self-care or whatever. And it doesn't have to be some grand gesture. You don't need to be going on a vacation every weekend. Um, but, you know, just do something for yourself to just sort of recharge, right? Whether that is um, hanging out with friends or, you know, for me, like an ideal Friday night is not talking to anyone. You know, a lot of what I do is, is you know, in people involved, right? And I, and I am an extrovert, but even extroverts have their moments, right? And so uh, Friday night for me, the perfect Friday night is a date with myself, you know, like I may go out, I may have a meal with myself, literally, um, and just like go home and watch Netflix or something and just, you know, relax and not talk to anybody. And sometimes my phone is off, you can't reach me. And so, you know, just being able to have those moments to yourself where you can recharge so that you're, you're ready, you're engaged, you know, you're, you're willing to do the work. And, you know, just even as a student, you know, you, you don't always just want to be, um, you know, like class, homework, like extracurriculars, whatever. It can be very draining. And so you want to also give yourself time to relax. And, and you know, it could just be small things. Like, you know, for me, it's a, a morning cup of coffee that that will set me right. You know, if I don't have my coffee in the morning, you can tell because I'll probably be very cranky. Um, but, you know, if I do, I'm, I'm set for the day. Or right before I go to bed, I usually drink tea, calms me down, you know. So just like listen to yourself, listen to your body um, and and uh, uh, do do what it's telling you to do. Because if you don't, uh, sort of the older you get, uh, the more I think you'll start to regret that. Yeah, great advice at any age, definitely. Because uh, I know the types of students that are attracted to the, this program and activism while they're in high school tend to be taking, you know, demanding classes and uh, can get a little stressful. So definitely, definitely good advice. Um, would love to hear, you know, I know the panels have been at at the work, this work for various lengths of time, but love to hear a reflection of um, something that you've been able to accomplish that you're most proud of. Something, something, just give us a taste of, um, you know, some something that really made you feel like, wow, I was able to accomplish blank, and that really, really uh, reminds me of why why I do this work. Anyone have a want to start on that? A moment or a success you'd like to share? Yes, Ariana, please. All right. So recently we had like the busiest time in Budget Buddies history. Like I think we had like 10 programs running. We hit like a milestone of participants. There was like 100 new participants starting. Um, so we needed volunteers. So part of our model is one-on-one -on -one coaching. So for every participant, they have one coach and this coach is there to like be like, the open ears, open heart, open, like to just support them and not judge them and be totally like there for them and their specific financial goals, but also listening to them as like a whole person. And it has to be a woman. So, um, because it's like woman to woman, women empowering each other. So I had to, um, find all these volunteers and half of them had to speak Spanish. So we found all the volunteers, all the volunteers were filled, but it was a very big pull of like, what networks do we have? Like social media ads, all this stuff. So I was pretty happy when we got the news that like every woman in the program had a coach. 
Nice. Who else? Brian. Oh, that's your celebration, not a hand raise, but do you want to go next? <laughs> as I starting to call uh, Sure. So a singular one, it's hard to, to pinpoint. I worked on my largest grant making program, my first grant making program and my largest grant making program last year, um, which I had to review um, like 150 different nonprofit grant proposals in a very short amount of time um, and, and help the foundation make some funding decisions. Um, and it was a collection of, of my experiences where I was analyzing friends of, of folks who I've gotten to know through the, my work in the Boston nonprofit area, as well as a lot of people I didn't know. And it was a culmination experience of like, oh, the work that I've put in to myself, the work that I've been exposed to from other people who are so much smarter than me and so much better in every single way, it can all align. And I think um, I enjoy moments when the weird map that I've taken to get to where I am so, sort of has a has a, a through way where it's like, oh, all of these experiences that you've chosen to do in a random order can have meaning. And that was for me last year. Nice. Great. Sam, you want to get in? Yeah. So a singular moment is also difficult, uh, echoing Brian. Um, you know, uh, what, one thing I, I one thing I'm proud of uh, for sure is uh, uh, so growing up. Uh, you know, I grew up in Cambridge, and um, I uh, uh, for part of my life, uh, you know, uh, spent a lot of time at the Cambridge Community Center um, and uh, did a, a after school there and summer camp, and it was a just big part of my childhood uh, growing up and. Uh, um, I aged out of their programs back then when I was 13, 14 ish. Um, and uh, it's, it's a, a place that I still very much call home. Uh, and so a few years ago, um, I, uh, was, uh, I was hired uh, to work at the Cambridge Community Center as the Director of Engagement and Partnerships. And uh, this was uh, tied to sort of their 90th anniversary. Um, the Community Center was founded in 1929. Uh, by a group of Black pastors uh, for the community um, because the YMCA in Cambridge at the time was uh, whites only. And so uh, everybody else really needed uh, a space to uh, get together. And it's just been such a great hub for the community. And even now in the pandemic, they've done such a great job responding to the needs of the community and, um, and whatnot. But, um, you know, uh, part of my job was to sort of help the community center tell its story and, and to uh, raise more money and to build more partnerships and to uh, strengthen relationships with government. Um, and so there was a lot on my plate. Um, and one of the big projects that I was working on as well was the uh, 90th anniversary year. So in 2019, um, and I developed a year uh, worth of, of a year's worth of events uh, and activities uh, to really celebrate uh, the occasion. And uh, the sort of you know pinnacle of that was uh, a gala that we put together. This really lovely, fancy event. Uh, partnered up with MIT. Uh, they gave us the venue for free. It was this just gorgeous ballroom uh, that they had. And, you know, just filling it up with people, raising a ton of money, getting getting a lot of corporations to um, uh, uh, write checks and sponsorships. And just, you know, the, the way that it all came together uh, was just really beautiful. Um, it made me happy to be able to, uh, you know, help significantly contribute to uh, a place that I call home, uh, a place that helped me grow, a place that gave me a lot of great childhood memories. Um, and so uh, that was that was really beautiful. It was gratifying, it was humbling, um, you know, and it was just great. And it was like, yeah, like life comes at you full circle sometimes, right? And you just, you never know where, where uh, you'll be. And, uh, you know, I was on the board uh, of the center for a while and uh, just, you know, really uh, still committed to that place and, and uh, glad to see that it's still flourishing uh, and providing opportunities to another set of uh, children and youth. And, and, you know, they've grown since I was there. It was only, uh, they had programs for sort of adults and seniors and, and for 
young people, but they've done a, a lot over the last decade to have programs for teenagers too. So it's not just children, but but teenagers are there, and and uh, it's just great to see that you know uh, people have a place to go after school and and congregate, collaborate, uh, and and whatever it is that they're into, there's something for them there. And so uh, that was really fun uh, to be able to do that. I was very proud uh, to to be able to uh, sort of direct that 90th anniversary uh, year of celebrations. Um, and, and uh, you know, people to this day, you know, when they see me, they're like, hey, Sam, that was amazing. Like, you know, I, I had a lot of fun. It was also a reunion for a lot of people. Uh, there were people there that hadn't seen each other in decades. Uh, and so it was just, you know, like there, there wasn't a dry eye in the room. It was really beautiful uh, to see that. And so, um, you know, uh, definitely uh, one of my more uh, happier moments in the last few years. That's great. Great give back story. Well, you are a fun question. That's a, like, that's a little hard to follow. And honestly, <laughs> I've been sort of, yeah, I mean, um, also I've been sort of struggling to think about it. Um, I think one thing, I came to Boston about seven years ago, um, a little tiny bit more. And um, I, uh, so, and I sort of started fresh here in some ways. Um, I was working in places where the English was not the first language. And so I was translating a lot of my skills also into English after a while. And um, one of the things that I developed was also a community program um, that was actually looking at immigration and bringing together people from different aspects of the immigrant community to have conversations. This program morphed maybe 10 times in my seven years in Boston. Every time I went to a new organization, I took sort of the roots or the, the bones of this project and made it into something different. Um, used it with funders, used it with all like very um, established community members that were looking to sort of understand their role in community. Use it now as a community facilitation program that we still run at the network. We call it one of our signature programs. It's I have a whole bunch of instructors all over the US now who are coming to do this program with me. And it's so interesting that things, you never know when you start something, what it's going to turn into. Um, but, you know, programs specifically, just like organizations are sort of living things and they take on the different forms of the people who are coming into them and giving them their energy. So I'm proud of that program, whatever it happens to be called in a year. Um, and yeah. Great, great. We are getting close to the end of our time and we try, do try to keep on schedule for these programs. I would love to give the panelists a chance um, for either to underscore a piece of advice you've already either given or maybe heard or maybe share something. If there's something you're hoping to bring to the table today that, that a question didn't bring forth to do that. But if we could try to keep each final remarks, almost like something you could put on a, on a tweet you know, about that length, about uh, 30 seconds or so, and we'll take us, we'll take us right till two. So I don't know if anybody feels ready to jump in and do that, uh, or if you need a moment, you can go. Yeah, I'll, oh, go oh. ahead, go ahead. <laughs> All right, we'll do Ariana and then Sam, and then we'll yeah, have Leora yeah. and, and Brian can fight it out for three cool. and four. All right, well, I'm already just impressed that you guys are here as high school students, like on a Sunday, taking time out of your day. I'm sure you take time out of your day for this program all the time. And I feel like that's already like such an amazing first step because I was not involved in things like that when I was in high school. And looking back, like, and having worked with kids um, in programs, I'm just like impressed. Like I'm always super impressed by you guys. So I feel like you're already like 10 steps ahead you already have your um, head in the right place. Great, thank you. Sam? Yeah, um, you know, just really quickly. Uh, one is, you know, the prior point of, um, you know, like reach out to people, like, you know, and, and just to echo Ariana, like, kudos, you could be doing anything else right now. Uh, you could also be sleeping right now. Like, so like literally you could be, you know, it's cold, but it's sunny. You could be doing anything else. So I'm dropping my contact info in the chat box. You know, if anyone ever wants to, you know, call me, email me, text me, like whatever. Um, I, I do hope that some of you reach out if I can be helpful at all to you, um, you know, please, I do expect you to reach out. Um, my, my tweetable quote, I guess, is, um, you know, uh, don't ask for permission, um, you know, just because you're young. If you have something uh, that you want to do, if you have something that's on your mind, just do it. Um, never ask to be invited to something or never rather wait to be invited to something. Um, never ask for permission. 
um, just get up and do it. Uh, don't don't let your age hold you back. Don't let uh, your experience or lack of it or whatever hold you back. Um, just 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 step up and do whatever it is that you want to do. Great, excellent. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, we've all quoted Jay-Z without acknowledging that we quoted Jay-Z. So you could be anywhere in the world, but you're here with us. And I think that's like a great way to sort of think about nonprofit work. Um, you are here on a Sunday afternoon, and this is like, maybe this is your comfort level because you're able to do this over Zoom, et cetera, but keep it up. Um, Zoom, the world is going to change yet again. Um, and maybe then again, we don't know, but, um, but keep it up and maybe go beyond your comfort zone. Thanks, Leora. Brian, we give it to you. To... Uh, the boring MBA and, and funder answer I have is, is if you're interested in nonprofit work, pay attention to who pays for it and how they build their budget. And it's something that I wish I did much younger. And it's something that, um, you know, to Samuel's point, don't ask for permission to ask those questions, mm -hmm. um, but, but find out how, how folks finance the world. And I think you can go a lot farther. That's great. Well, well, I would like to thank the four panelists. You have packed a lot of great uh, wisdom and advice and, and shared experience into uh, our one hour here. And, and not exactly by design, but uh, you know, a little serendipitously, I think we've got a very great balance of experiences and perspectives. So I would like to uh, give the panel a big thank you. And as others have said, thank you uh, to the students who have joined on a Sunday afternoon. And you signed up for this, so we have your info. So we will definitely be following up with other programs and opportunities that both SCI and the network have coming up, uh, coming up soon. So good stuff uh, happening this spring. So we'll just leave that as a teaser because we're at two o'clock. And but keep keep an eye on your inbox uh, for more good stuff to come. So with that, we will officially close. Um, and thank thank you, everyone.